Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your genes. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, we explore the surprisingly complex story of Crook's radiometer. But first up, here's a long bunch of short news. A virus to cure diabetes. A research team at the University of Texas Health Science Center San Antonio used a genetically engineered virus to transfer the genes to make insulin to a mouse's pancreas and stomach so the mice can start making insulin on their own, curing the mouse's diabetes. The university has patented the technology and hopes to commercialize the treatment for humans. Their paper was titled beta cell formation in vivo through cellular networking, integration and processing in wild-type adult mice, and was published in the journal Current Pharmaceutical Biotechnology. Butterfly power. The neotropical morphodidius butterfly wings have tiny cone-shaped nanostructures that scatter light to create a striking blue iridescence. Inspired by the iridescence, a team from the Australian National University has designed nanostructures that allow them to finely control the direction of different colours of light onto the two layers of tandem solar cells. All of the blue, green and ultraviolet colours of sunlight are absorbed in a perovskite layer of the solar cell, and all of the red, orange and yellow light in a silicon layer. ANU broke the record for solar cell efficiency with this design before the nanostructures were added. When perfected, the tiny cones should give a big boost to the already record-breaking solar cells. Their paper was titled, Transparent Long Pass Filter with Short Wavelength Scattering Based on Morpho Butterfly Nanostructures, and was published in the journal ACS Photonics. Off-grid to be banned. A new proposed battery standard from Standards Australia would effectively ban lithium-ion batteries from being used to power buildings by classifying them as a Category 1 fire risk. If enacted, the proposed standard would require lithium-ion house batteries to be installed in a concrete bunker, making them impractical for most places and too expensive for the rest. Mobile phone batteries and laptop batteries wouldn't be affected by the ban. The European standard sets out in detail the operating requirements of such batteries, but doesn't ban them in buildings and homes. The American standard, which is similar to the European standard, can't be adopted because of a lack of commercial agreement between the two bodies. The report was published as Roadmap for Energy Storage Standards by Standards Australia. Cannabis for memory improvement. Researchers at the University of Bonn, in collaboration with colleagues at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, have shown that aged mice taking prolonged low doses of tetrahydrocannabinol from cannabis perform better in cognitive tests than undrugged mice of the same age. The doped mice perform better in tests such as orientation skills and the recognition of other mice. They performed as well as undoped young mice. The researchers found that as we age, the levels of natural cannabinoids produced in our brain reduce contributing to a reduction in cognitive functions. As a result, the researchers concluded that the brain's natural cannabinoids reduce as we age, contributing to the reduction in cognitive functions. As they applied the cognitive therapy, the number of links between neurons in the mouse's brains increased, making learning easier. The paper was titled, A Chronic Low Dose of Delta-9 Tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, Restores Cognitive Function in Old Mice, and was published in the journal nature medicine. Drugs for better hearing. People's ability to distinguish between different sounds fades as we age, and levels of a protein called adenosine increase in the thalamus as we age. 
Researchers at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, used a drug that blocks adenosine receptors in the brain to improve the ability of mice to distinguish between different sounds. They tested the mice by playing a continuous background tone and then added a tone of a slightly different pitch. Treated aged mice showed surprise when the tone changed pitch. If the benefit transfers to humans, then as well as helping aged people hear better, it could also help people recover from stroke and those suffering from tinnitus. The paper was titled Restoring Auditory Cortex Plasticity in Adult Mice by Restricting Thalamic Adenosine Signaling and was published in the journal Science. And finally, the Australian government won't answer your call, but they will break your phone. Centrelink, Australia's social security service, have used military-grade technology normally used to fight terrorism, to break into people's phones in an extreme bid to find welfare fraud. In 2017, there are nearly seven people seeking jobs for every single job advertised in Australia. Centrelink are using a universal forensic extraction device, previously only used by intelligence agencies and federal police to investigate terrorism. The device from the Celebrite company can hack past the security of a mobile phone and forcibly extract all of your personal information from passwords to photos to call logs. The Australian Federal Police are obtaining warrants to search the phones of unemployed and disabled people on behalf of the government in cases of non-compliance. Non-compliance is defined as not showing up for a routine interview or not answering a question that Centrelink failed to ask them. Non-compliance is not a crime under the Crimes Act, despite the Australian Federal Police claim that they're violating your privacy for the government under a warrant issued for a suspected infringement of the Crimes Act. The firing of tens of thousands of Centrelink staff and the scrapping of phone queues means that nobody is answering the Centrelink phones for weeks on end. It was reported to the Senate Estimates Committee that 42 million calls have gone unanswered by Centrelink in the 10 months from July to April, compared with 22 million calls unanswered in 2014. People can no longer visit a Centrelink office to talk to someone in person without being directed to a broken website. Instead, the Department of Human Services have been invading people's privacy using a Celebrite device to break into people's phones 50 times in the last 12 months. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Crook's radiometer, or light mill, is a mostly evacuated glass bulb with a vein inside that spins when you shine light on it. I picked mine up in a magic shop, but you can find them online. It came with a clear explanation of how pressure from light made the veins spin, as light bounced off the silver side of the veins and transferred some movement. A pity it happened to be completely wrong. The first thing I was reminded of when I saw my first radiometer was Arthur C. Clarke's solar sailing ships. Arthur C. Clarke wrote about how the pressure of sunlight predicted by Maxwell can be captured by large, thin, reflective sails in a vacuum of space, and be used to race small, light spaceships around the solar system. I was sure, looking at the light making the veins of the radiometer spin, that this was how it worked. Photons of light were pushing the veins around by transferring some of their momentum. The vein spins easily due to a lack of friction in the evacuator bulb. There was a basic experiment we'd done at school where you pump the air out of a bell jar while an electric bell is ringing and a light is shining. The bell goes quiet as the lack of air stops transmitting the sound. But the light keeps shining in the vacuum because it doesn't need a medium to transfer its energy. The sound is made of waves of air or some other medium like water. So in a vacuum, there's nothing for sound to wave. In space, no one can hear you scream. After watching the radiometer, 
I had an argument with an engineering student online who was certain there was not light pressure that moved the veins, but heated gas. He said, Light heated up the tiny amounts of gas still in the evacuator bulb, and the motion of this heated air moved away from the black side of the vein and caused it to spin. As I learned when I went on to study a physics degree, there are two ways to solve a physics problem. There is the commonest easy-to-mark way, which is by deriving 10 pages of calculus, then doing the arithmetic and getting an answer, and then understanding how that's translated into the physical system as an afterthought. This makes it easy for teachers to follow your thinking and see how you arrived at your answer. An analyzer would have gone to an authoritative text to derive the formula for pushing power in the light pressure over the surface area of the diamond paddles on the vein and figured out whether it was strong enough to move the veins. Then there's visualizing the physical system, understanding how it works, and then using just a few lines of maths to find the answer. This gets you the answer in half a page instead of 10 pages, demonstrates a deep understanding of the physics, and is essential to working out experiments to discover new things. It's much harder to mark, because you can't easily follow the student's understanding on the page. Most universities are biased towards students who use mathematical reasoning, and against students who naturally use the visualising system. I'm a visualiser, so I worked out a way to test which interpretation of how the device moved was true. One of the details of the radiometer is that the vein holds little diamond shapes to catch the light. They're black on one side and reflective silver on the other. I reasoned that if light pressure pushed the reflective side of the veins, then the vein would rotate away from the silver side anti-clockwise. If it were light heating the black side so that the thin gases were expanding and giving it a kick, it would rotate away from the black side clockwise. So I now had a simple experiment. I could put the radiometer in the sun or a strong lamp and simply observe whether it rotated clockwise or anti-clockwise and I would know. If I'd been an analyzer, I could have done 10 pages of calculus and found that you need a very large surface area for the push from light to cause visible movement. And the radiometer veins are way too small to be pushed by that force. I performed the experiment and saw that the vein rotated clockwise, away from the black surface, the opposite of what I predicted. There seemed to be no question that it was light heating the black surface, which heated the thin gases nearby, which pushed the vein around clockwise, against the much reduced air resistance in the thin atmosphere of the evacuator bulb. I had been on the wrong side of the argument, persuaded by the beauty of the idea of light pressure operating a toy. But victory was mine, because I'd thought up a way to find out for sure by an experiment that anyone could do. An experiment is a way of looking it up against the ultimate authority, the real world. And yet, the current understanding of radiometer physics is that it's not heated gases that push the veins around. It's a 138-year-old conundrum. So William Crookes invented the radiometer in 1873 and he was of the opinion that the vein was rotated by light pressure, just as I had been. The paper he published to the Royal Society was refereed by James Clerk Maxwell, who developed the electromagnetic theory of light. Maxwell accepted Crookes' explanation, which appeared to fulfil his prediction that light should exert pressure. After publication, Crookes came to realise that the veins in his light mill were turning the wrong way for light pressure to be the cause. How embarrassing. The next most obvious explanation was that the thin gas was heated on the surface of the vein and pushed it as the gas expanded. Crookes didn't want to be wrong again, so he spent a lot of effort thinking this through. He worked out that the expansion of the gas by heating from light falling on it was cancelled out by the heat also lowering the pressure of the gas near the vein. So you can't get any fresh gases to the vein's surface, so no more gas will be heated to drive it around. As the gas molecules bounce off the black vein with greater energy, they push away incoming gas molecules. It's as if every time you tried to light a candle, the sparks kept the oxygen away from the wick. Or, technically, the forces cancel out because the mean free path between the collisions between air molecules becomes longer for lower pressures, 
until, in the near vacuum of the radiometer, that path is much longer than the diameter of the glass bulb. My engineer friend was wrong too. So what does make a radiometer spin in the light? In 1879, Osborne Reynolds observed a phenomenon he called thermal transpiration. He found that if you heat one side of a porous surface, that the cold air moves over to the hotter side, giving it a kick. This is contrary to what you'd expect from the laws of thermodynamics that say that heat always moves from the hotter to the colder. Heat won't pass from a cooler to a hotter. Heat won't pass from a cooler to a hotter. You can try it if you like, but you'd far better not. Uh. You can try it if you like, but you far better not. Uh. Cause the coal in the cooler will get hotter as a ruler. Cause the coal in the cooler will get hotter as a ruler. Cause the hotter body's heat will pass to the cooler. Cause the hotter body's heat will pass to the cooler. However, this is now gas dynamics, not just the movement of heat, but of gas molecules. Gas dynamics is weird. The vein in Crookes radiometer is not porous, but Reynolds worked out that there's an edge turbulence phenomenon that he called thermal creep that behaves just like thermal transpiration. The coal gas moves around the edge towards the hot side giving the hot side a steady supply of new coal gas to heat. This thermal creep provides a force that makes the vein spin. The heated gas does move away from the vein, and the coal gas creeps around the edge to resupply the source of heated gas. This is the explanation you'll find in the best textbooks and online references. This hasn't convinced everybody. There have been a huge number of specialised radiometers made to try and tease out all the effects in the last 138 years. Thermal creep and thermal transpiration predict that if you put lots of little holes in the veins of the radiometer, it should spin more quickly. But this is not what you observe. It goes more slowly. Reportedly, even Albert Einstein had a good try at finding extra effects to explain the rotation fully but only found the photoelectric effect wasn't strong enough to make up the difference between prediction and the real speed of the spin. So, thermal creep is unlikely to be the complete explanation, and we don't really know for sure all the causes of the force that makes the vein of a radiometer spin. Now, some people online report that if you put your radiometer in the fridge, it will rotate backwards. Do try this at home, it didn't work for me. Be careful when you search online for radiometer information. There are spiritualists who will tell you on many pages that psychokinesis is the force spinning the vein because they can make it spin by putting their hand on the bulb. Of course, they don't discuss that the heat from anyone's hand will also spin the vein. So we're back to heat. Crook's radiometer is a little mystery you can buy cheaply and sit in a window and watch. Someday, we'll fully understand why it spins. So my name is Alex Payne. I am a student of biology and chemistry on exchange at UNSW uh, here for the semester. And I'm on the organizing committee for the march in Sydney. Awesome. So this is the March for Science. What are we marching about? We're marching about a whole bunch of things, actually. So the, the big idea is that we want to do a better job at, as, as scientists. So those of us who are here, not all of us are scientists here, but those of us here as scientists are sort of saying that we want to do a better job of communicating uh, good science with the public, with coordinating with policymakers about what good policy, a good science-related policy is and how that works. We want to do a better job of not just saying we're scientists and we're smart and we know what's right so just listen to us but doing a better job of having a relationship with the community and understanding that you know we might have a good idea of what's going on but it doesn't matter what the theory is we have to actually apply it to real policy so there's that whole piece um, but we're also standing up as a community of you know just citizens who are saying that we're concerned with some of the rhetoric from politicians and in the media as well that doesn't seem to be giving science the sort of credit and authority that we feel like it's due. So the idea is that if, if anyone can say what they think about what is true about the world and we don't consider science, we're going to be missing out on a lot of important things. And you know, if we don't take the science seriously, we might find ourselves in, in trouble in a lot of ways. And the thing is, you know, the basic idea really here is like, we like science. Science has done a lot of good things for society. And it's concerning to see 
that you know a, a lot of Australians actually really love love science and really believe that it's a good source of authority but when it comes down to actually using it in productive ways and using it to understand things like GMOs and fluoride in the water and all these sort of things it gets a little bit more murky so we're just here to say that science is important and that we need to do a better job as, as scientists, as policymakers, as citizens, as journalists, working together to establish uh, a conversation and policy that really makes the best use of science for our country. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And now, everyday physics. A warning for people experiencing hot weather. If you're in very hot weather and you have the good fortune to have air conditioning and insulation in your building, do not open the window to catch a breeze. A breeze cools you down by moving air over your sweaty skin and evaporating the sweat. As the water evaporates, the reaction of converting water from a liquid to a gas steals some heat from your skin, cooling you for a very, very short time. However, breezes from a hot summer's day are hot. So while they will temporarily cool you as they evaporate your sweat, they will also heat up the building you've spent money to cool down, leaving you hotter for longer. There's really no point getting insulation in your roof and walls if you're going to just let the heat in through open doors and windows. If you want a breeze, switch on a fan. It will cost you less energy than cooling a room after you've allowed hot air inside. In summer, I recommend you have some windows open at night for ventilation and have everything sealed up during the day to keep out the heat. In winter, if you don't have central air conditioning that takes care of ventilation to keep your air clean and fresh, do the opposite and only have windows open for ventilation in the warmest parts of the day, sealing them to keep the heat in overnight when the air is coldest you'll be able to breathe fresh air while keeping warm with lower power bills. This message has been brought to you by Everyday Physics. Not just a collection of facts, but a whole way of thinking about the world that's applicable to everyday life. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your voice on radio? Record a voice memo on your phone or use the voicemail tab on the website. We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion, send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions, and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and would like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Support the show at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 27 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2MVR in Nambucca Valley, and 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, then you can explore more than 900 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. <laughs>